Well, thank you, folks, for coming back again. I hope you've enjoyed a wee break. Some chocolate. Chocolate's always good this time of the day. Chocolate and a cup of tea. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed that. Uh, unless you're diabetic, of course, uh, you shouldn't be having chocolate. Uh, our thoughts in this session are going to be centred in uh, John 15, as is obvious with the title. So uh, let's turn, please, to John 15. And I want to thank you so much for your prayers uh, for these, these meetings. I have uh, known in my heart the help of the Lord and the support of the Lord, and that is down to the prayers of the Lord's people. So thank you very much and uh, uh, to the saints for that. So our, our section is uh, from verse 1 of chapter 15 to verse 17. Now, I, th I think that seems to be a section, and it's important to, to see that because there's a significance with verse 1 and verse 17. So we're going to really ask two very simple questions in this session, although it might take us a little while to answer them. Uh, number one, what is the fruit that the Lord is speaking of in John 15? And number two, how is this fruit produced? So those are the two questions that are, are before us today. And the first half of our meeting, we'll look at what the fruit is, or the first quarter or so. And then for the rest of the, the time, we'll look at how the Lord teaches that this fruit will be produced. So let's begin our reading at verse one. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. Or in your margin it says, or severed from me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that you love one another. And that will do for the reading just now, and we trust with the Lord's blessing on his word. <laughs> I have found, <clears throat> brothers and sisters, that as a young believer, and even uh, as I'm growing older, that sometimes this passage of scripture is encouraging, and then other times is quite frightening. Uh, I don't think the Lord ever gave it to us to make us afraid. So I think uh, if that is the result of this meeting, I think I have failed. I hope that as a result of this time together, you will all be encouraged. The two questions that lie before us, number one, what is the fruit the Lord is speaking of and is it important? And number two, how is this fruit produced? Uh, with the help of the Lord will give us, as we answer these questions, an understanding 
of what this passage is about. Now, usually, whenever we come to chapter 15, if you're speaking with believers that are interested in the Word of God, the usual question they ask is, what does it mean to abide in Christ? What does that mean? I think before we answer that, we have to actually listen to the Lord. Because the Lord doesn't start off chapter 15 and say, abide in me. He starts off and says, I am the true vine. And I think, brothers and sisters, that's the answer to the understanding of this passage. I am the true vine. Now, what was it the Lord was saying here? Well, when you go back to the Old Testament, the word of God teaches us that Israel was a vine. Isaiah chapter 5 says, The vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. Psalm number 80 teaches us as well that the Lord took a vine out of Egypt and he brought it into the land of Canaan and planted it and it became a mighty vine. And so Israel was God's vine on this earth. The vessel through which God desired to be glorified. Now, how were Israel to do that? What was it Israel had to do in order to bring forth fruit for God? So, what is the fruit? Well, Isaiah chapter 5, verse 7 says, in the context of the vine, Israel being the vine, God looked for judgment, but behold, oppression. For righteousness, but behold, a cry. So what was the Lord looking for? Well, God, Jehovah was looking for conformity to his law and a proper and God-glorifying way of treating each other. That's what God was looking for. This was what the nation of Israel should have brought forth, should have produced. Really, what God was looking for is encapsulated in the law. Okay? So the law then is what God desired was to be seen in the nation of Israel. And if the law was seen, then fruit was being produced and God was glorified. Now, what is that law? Well, you know the Ten Commandments, but let's listen to the words of the Lord Jesus. Mark 12 and 30. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first, comm the first commandment and the second is like namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Okay. So what was God looking for in the nation of Israel? He was looking for love to God and love for others. I think that's very straightforward to understand. I hope it is anyway. Now, when you come to this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ says, I am the true vine. Why does he say that? Well, very simply because Israel failed. Israel failed miserably. They didn't produce love to God and they didn't produce love to others. They were marked by idolatry and they were marked by oppression not kindness and love. And so the Lord in his teaching in John 15 doesn't say that the church is now going to replace Israel, that Israel was a field vine, didn't produce fruit for God, but now the church is going to produce fruit for God. He doesn't say that. And it's very important to grasp this. The church is not the replacement for Israel with regard to producing fruit. Christ is the replacement. For Israel. He is the true vine. He is the genuine vine. He is the one that produces what? He produces love to God and love for others. He is the fulfillment of the law. And so when Christ was here on earth, God was glorified, the Father was glorified in what Christ produced in his life. He says, I am the true vine. Now, 
come to the last verse of our section and look what happens. It's not now, well, it is actually the Lord still producing love, but look what it sounds like. It says, these things I command you that you love one another. You do it. So what's the fruit that we're talking about in John chapter 15? You may think this is a, a roundabout way of coming to a very simple point, but the fruit, I believe, is love. That's what it is. It's love for God and love for others. Now, primarily, God or the Lord Jesus is going to speak about love for others. Because where, where there is true love for others, of course, there's love for God. Now, whenever you think about this, the Lord Jesus Christ is teaching these men how love is going to be produced when he's away. Now, I hope, if you're still listening to me, that that excites you. What is it as Christians that we always come to when we're on our knees? If you're thinking about service, if you're thinking about your family, if you're thinking about your marriage, there comes a point when we, we kind of come to this point all the time, if only I could love more. If it is that I could be marked with the same love of, that Christ was marked with, within the words of 1 Corinthians 13, I could endure longer, I would forgive, I would take no account of evil done against me. Charity does that. Uh, charity suffereth long and is kind. I would be gentle. Uh, I wouldn't be irritated. I wouldn't get exasperated. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13, love is not provoked. I would rejoice when others are being blessed and not envious of them. That's a, that's a big thing. We can be envious of our fellow brothers and sisters because of the gift they have, because even of the popularity that we think they have because of the significance that we think they have, and we're envious of it. And when it hits your heart, you go, I need, you know what I need? I need love. If I had love, <laughs> well, everything would be different. Now, this is exactly what the Lord is teaching his disciples here. I'm going to go away, but I am the true vine. And when love is produced through the branches of this vine, it's a tremendously important thing. Now, there's five reasons why it's important. We'll go through these quickly. Number one, the sun is represented accurately. Look at verse eight. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. Or in this way, you will be known as my disciples. How does the world know what Christ looks like? when he's represented accurately, and that only happens whenever we love, okay? Uh, John 13 and 35, by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have loved one for another. So the son is accurately represented through love. Number two, the father is glorified through love. It's in the same verse that we've read. Herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2, the same thought. Walk in love, as Christ also hath loved us, and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savour. Whenever we walk in love, there is an aroma that goes to God, that delights God, that pleases God. So whenever the sun is accurately represented, and we learned earlier on that the father is revealed in the sun, and the sun is accurately represented, then God himself is represented in this world. Uh, uh, importance number three, we remain in his love. So the sun is represented, the father is glorified, and we remain in the atmosphere of love. That's what he says in verse 10. If you keep my commandments, what are his commandments? Well, it's love one another. If you keep my commandments, you shall remain 
in my love. And it's the idea, I think, of remaining in the joy, in the comfort, in the assurance of his love. It's true, we thought about this earlier on, it's true that a father can love two boys, two children. But one child, because of his uh, uh, disobedience, because of his waywardness, is not in the joy of the father's love. He, he, he's, he's experiencing maybe the discipline of the father's love, but he's not remaining in the joy of it. So when we love one another, well, we remain in the, in the father's love. We remain in the love of Christ. And those of you who know what that means, knows that that's a tremendous thing. The fourth thing, the saints are blessed. When love is produced, the saints are blessed. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. And so whenever love is expressed and shown, whenever this fruit is produced, then the saints that we come into contact with are loved as Christ loves them. That's a tremendous thing. What an encouragement that other Christians love us as Christ loves us. And then the fourth thing, or sorry, the fifth thing, uh, the world has a witness. Look at verse 16. You have not chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that, that your fruit should remain and that whatsoever you ask, the Father in my name, he may give it you. It's going forth and bringing forth fruit. Go and bring forth fruit. The world has a witness. Chapter 14, verse 31, that the world might know that I love the Father. Sometimes we say that this fruit in chapter 15 is not about souls getting saved. Well, I think actually by extension it is. Whenever love is produced in our lives and is evident, the world out there comes into contact with the love of Christ. And that's a witness to him. Now it's true that fruit can produce, fruit can be produced, and there's no people, are, there's 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 no one gets saved. I understand that, but I think the point of it is here that when fruit is produced, the fruit of the love of God is produced in our lives. Then it's a witness to the world, and they too will come in to the good of that. David Gooding says this. He says the branch is the functional extension of the vine. Okay. We don't just produce fruit, brothers and sisters, so we can look at each other and say how wonderful we are. Oh, your patience is tremendous, brother. And oh, no, your love is amazing and your kindness is great. It's not to congratulate each other. Uh, conformity to Christ has a purpose behind it. There's function with it. And it's as we are conformed to Christ that we go out into the world and become witnesses for him. So those are five, five things. Uh, the son is represented accurately. The father is glorified. We remain in the atmosphere of love. The saints are blessed and the world has an accurate witness. OK. So the question I suppose we could ask is how is this fruit produced? How is it produced? Well, there are three parts to answering that question and we're going to focus primarily on the third part but I want to just mention the first two. For this fruit to be produced you need to have the vine, you need to have a husband man or a farmer or uh, the protector of the vine and you need to have the branch. Now the Lord tells us about these things, he says I am the true vine, my father is the husbandman and you are the branches. So let's look at number one very briefly of the ability of the vine. It is the vine, brothers and sisters, that produces the fruit. It's not the branches. It's important to get that. It is the vine that produces the fruit, not the branches. Whenever we talk about this love, it is not primarily your love. It's not your love whipped up to make it to, to look somewhere like God's love. It is actually his love flowing through you and producing fruit. Okay, so he, we think of the ability of the vine, it's 
It's him is the vine, he is the vine, and he produces the fruit. Uh, he talks about I in you. Look at verse 4. Abide in me and I in you. Look at verse 5. He that abideth in me and I in him. So it's, it's Christ in us. It's that flowing through of his love through us and in us out and producing fruit. Uh, so the ability of the vine. Then you have the second thing is the care of the father. So the father is the husbandman. And the care of the father is seen in different ways. It's seen in, the, in, in cleansing and in cleaning. He says in verse 2, he purgeth it, he cleans the vine, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, there's a couple here, and I need to be very straight with you. Verse 2 and verse 6 I find quite difficult. Uh, I don't know if any of you have any surprising answers for me, but they are very difficult verses in the context. But I think if we keep it in the context of, of producing fruit, maybe the difficulty is taken away. I wouldn't be dogmatic on this. Absolutely not. But I think verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. I think that's the idea of the disciplining hand of the Lord. And then you come to verse 6. It's not the Lord that disciplines. It's if a don't shoot me down on this. It's if, a, if it was a Bible reading, people would be shouting. Uh, if it's a, a branch that is not producing fruit, well then the Lord says, men gather them up, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. I think that's got to do with the idea of testimony. There's now no longer testimony. Fruit is not produced, and there's no... There's, there's a uselessness then to Christian living. There's actually a uselessness to our lives if we are not producing this love and not allowing the love to flow through us. He also answers, the Father also answers prayer in verse 7 uh, and in verse 16. And the Father also loves the Son. If you look at verse 10, uh, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Where does that love come from? You say it comes from Christ. Absolutely. Where does his love come from? <laughs> well, his love comes from the Father. So the Father loves the Son. The Son loves us. And in that atmosphere of love, his love is produced in our lives, becomes a witness to the world. The Son is accurately represented, the Father's glorified, the world has a witness, the saints are blessed, and we remain in his love. I think that's the kind of idea behind it. So let's come to this phrase then, abide in me. If it is that we need the vine to produce the, the, the fruit, we need the care of the Father. But what also we need is the responsibility given to the branches. And that's where you and I come in. What does it mean then? to abide in me, or to abide in the vine. Now, we need to remember something. This is mightily important when it comes to this. This is, I think, where sometimes the fear comes in. The Lord Jesus Christ is not teaching us here about eternal security. He's not doing that. He's teaching us about bearing fruit. And so when he says, in me, our minds often just go to Ephesians, in me, in Christ. And we think about the union of members with the body, or sorry, uh, the, the, the union of the body with the head. The Lord is not talking about that. This is an earthly thing. He's talking about fruit produced on earth. And if I confuse it with the position that I have of being in Christ, then it frightens me when I think about the possibility of not abiding in Christ. Okay? I hope that comes across clearly. This is not about your union with Christ. This is not about your eternal security. This is about bearing fruit on earth for God's glory. And if we keep that in mind, I think it helps us to understand things. So let's let's give a, a, a very brief uh, 
uh, explanation of what abiding in Christ means. We kind of looked at it last session, although we didn't discuss it last session. Abiding in Christ is really remaining in communion with him. That's what it means. The Lord has just spoken to us about that in chapter John 14, what that means. The Holy Spirit within manifesting Christ to us, our hearts going out in love to Christ. And so abiding in Christ, abiding in me, means remaining in communion with him, in the atmosphere of his love. Okay? I don't know if that's helpful. <laughs> I hope it is. So we're going to look at what that looks like. And the next part of the meeting, I don't know how long we'll take, uh, maybe not too long, we're going to look at six different things associated with abiding in Christ. Number one, what does it mean to abide in Christ? Well, verse four really tells us that there has to be an abiding, there has to be a connection, there has to be an attachment between me and the Lord. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. And I think that takes us back to John 13 that we thought about. If there is a distance, brothers and sisters, between my heart and Christ, fruit will not be produced. If I refuse to get my feet washed and own up to and face my sin and defilement and character flaws and all that, if I refuse to have my feet washed, that distance remains. And in that sense, I am not connected to the vine. Remember, this has nothing to do with salvation. This has nothing to do with my eternal security. I'm not functionally connected to the vine so that his love can flow through me. Okay? So, uh, verse 5. What does it mean to, rem uh, to remain in communion with Christ or to abide in Christ? Uh, verse 5, it means this. We need to be dependent upon him. Dependency. That's hugely important. Sometimes we think, well, if I just read and pray every day, that must be me abiding in Christ. No, it's not. It is reading. And it is praying, but it's reading and praying in the spirit of absolute dependency on Christ. Look what he says here in verse 5. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. What a tremendous lesson to learn in Christian living. Young believer, those of you who are just newly saved, remember this. Without Christ. You can do nothing, nothing that will bring glory to him, nothing that will, that will accurately represent the Son, nothing that will bless your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and nothing that will be a witness to the world. We can do nothing. There's many things we can do, but without Christ, without that communion with him, we can't do anything of any worth. We can't do anything for him. It's like taking a branch and sticking it in the ground and seeing what it produces. And so often in Christian living, I have to confess that's what my life is like. I fail to understand and grasp the importance of communion with Christ, but I also see the need for service. And so I go ahead and try to serve God without being in communion with Christ. And it's like getting a branch, sticking it in the ground and waiting for something to grow. I think my mum and dad used to talk about you stick a feather in the ground and wish a hen would grow or something. Well, that's how useless it is. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. Uh, Jacob was like that. You remember Jacob's life? Jacob constantly was trying to organise things in his life. He was trying to do things in his life to bring himself into the blessing that already was promised him. He was scheming. He was deceiving. He was trying to until he met God, and God had to humble the man. And he was left with a limp. He was left with a permanent mark on his physical body that would emphasize in his life that he needed God. Brothers and sisters, 
God sometimes deals with us like that. God can leave a physical mark on our body or even in our mind to remind us constantly that we need him for absolutely everything. And I don't know, during this lockdown time, you know, the issues that you're coming through. But remember this, whatever you're coming through, think about it. Is, is it that the Lord is trying to get your attention? That you need him more than, more than anything else in this world. So number one, a dependency on Christ. Number two, an attraction towards Christ. There must be an attraction in our hearts towards him. Look what it says uh, all through this section. It talks about my words, my father, my disciples, my love, my commandments, my joy, my friends, and my name. And as we abide in Christ, as we remain in communion with Christ, it is that our hearts are taken up with him. There must be an attraction to him and for him. And that will be the case if it is that we are saved and our hearts are taken up with him. You look at 2 Corinthians 3 verse 18. But we all looking, this is, I think it's Darby's version. We all looking on the glory of the Lord with unveiled face are transformed according to the same image from glory to glory even as by the Lord, the Spirit. When we're taken up with him, we are transformed. Something happens, fruit is produced in our life. Uh, it's the power of a new affection. And so this is why Christians who uh, are loving the Lord, who are fruitful for the Lord, are usually Christians that love the Gospels. Love Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. These parts of the Word of God are not just little stories to tell Sunday school kids and then you really get into the deep stuff when you come to Romans and Ephesians and all that. That's the deep stuff. That's the important things. It's all his Word. But Christ is manifested. Christ is revealed in the Gospels to us, in his life, in his ministry, in his death, in his resurrection. And as our hearts are drawn out to him, then there's a transforming power by the Spirit of God and fruit is produced. So dependency on him, attraction towards him. Number three, obedience to him. Obedience to him. Look at verse seven. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you. Look at verse 10. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. Look at verse 12. This is my commandment. Look at verse 17. These things I command you, that you love one another. It's interesting, I didn't mention it at the start. Look at verse 17. These things, that's just what I've told you. These things I command you, in order that you love one another. You see, see how it fits into the fruit. So I've, these things I command you, all that I've just said from verses 1 to 16, in order that you would love one another. So there's obedience there. And it's not this cold obedience in the Old Testament. It's a different type of obedience. Number one, it's heart obedience. Go back to verse seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you. The Lord is saying here, I don't want my word to be a kind of poster in your room a list of 10 things that you have to do. That's not what it's about. I want my word in your heart for it to remain in you. The word is abide. It's the same word, abide or dwell, that my word is so precious to you that it has a dwelling place in your heart. Uh, remember Colossians, Paul tells us in Colossians, he says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. So it's not just about reading the Bible. It is that. But it's meditating on the Bible. Thinking about what we read. Allowing it to have a place in our heart. Giving it priority. And loving it. Not because it's the Bible. But because it's his word. That's it. 
So the Lord's going to be absent here, but he says, I've left you my word, his commandments. So here's a question, and it always comes up in teaching meetings like this. How often do you spend in the Bible? How often do you spend in his word? Does his word mean something to you? Because it's his. He loves you. He has left you his word. All of it. From Genesis through to Revelation. The whole book is his. And he has left it. That's one of the blessed uh, products, if you like, of the spirit of God being here. It is through him that we have the full canon of scripture. It has come from Christ through the spirit to us. We have it, his word. So there must be heart obedience. But number two, there must be loving obedience. Verse 10, if you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Even as I keep, kept my father's commandments and abide in his love. Why is it we keep his commandments? Here's a question. Why do we keep his commandments? Well, the Lord says here, you keep my commandments because you love me. We don't keep his commandments to get to heaven. We keep his commandments because we love him. And brothers and sisters, if you loved somebody naturally speaking in your family, you wouldn't do anything to upset them if you really love them. Now, loving someone is placing someone before yourself, placing someone else's importance before your own importance, loving someone more than you love yourself. And when you do that, then they become the most important thing. Their desires become most important. Their wants become most important. And so we obey his word. This is something maybe to go over to younger believers. To obey the word of God is not a cold thing. We do it. And we love to do it because it's his word. And we don't want to offend him. Look what he's done for us. We don't want to grieve him. We want to enjoy his love. We want him to enjoy us and us to enjoy him. And so it's a loving obedience. And number three, it's an informed obedience. This is a tremendous thing. It's an informed obedience. Look at verses 14. You're my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. What's the Lord saying there? He's saying, don't obey me just the way servants obey a king. Sort of with ignorance. They don't know what they're doing, but they're just doing it because there's an authoritative word and they have to obey it. The Lord says, yes, in one sense, you are my servants. But remember this. Henceforth, I call you not servants. For the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my father, I have made known unto you. And in the Old Testament, the believers, those of faith in the Old Testament, obeyed, but so often they had to obey blindly. There was many things they didn't know what they were doing them for. I'm not sure. We thought about the red heifer last night. I'm not sure if everybody that received the water of separation from the red heifer knew exactly what that signified. I don't think they did. But if they were faithful, they would do it. But there was a blindness. There was a veil over their obedience. But now come into the New Testament. What happens? There's an openness. The Lord Jesus Christ says, you're not just obeying me as servants, but I have shared with you my very heart. There is nothing more for you to know. And so when we come to the New Testament, we find particular things in the New Testament called mysteries. Mysteries. A mystery is something, is truth that has not been revealed in the Old Testament and is now revealed in the New Testament. Revealed by the apostles of Jesus Christ. That is that Christ has revealed something through his apostles to us. He's revealing his heart to us. He's revealing the purpose behind things. This is tremendous thing. The mystery of the kingdom, the incarnation. He didn't have to tell us about that. But he has. Great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in flesh. He's told us about the mystery of the blindness of Israel. 
the mystery of the church, the mystery of the translation of saints into glory, of resurrection, of the mystery of iniquity, of the mystery of the restoration of all things, of the headship of Christ, all these things. He's revealed this to us. Brothers and sisters, the word of God is the outpouring of the heart of Christ for his church. That's something to think about. The epistles, the gospels, it's the outpouring, the overflow of the heart of Christ for his church because we're his, well, he says, you're my friends. You're my friends. And so it's an informed obedience. So there is uh, dependency on him, attraction towards him, obedience to him. Then there's prayer through him. Look at verse seven. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. And then verse 16, you've not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain that whatsoever ye ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. So the Lord in effect is saying that I give you the permission to use my name when asking the Father for the production of fruit in your life. So this is not just a general prayer. These are prayers that have got to do with the production of fruit, with the, over, with the showing of love, the very love of God in our lives. And when we ask the Father in the name of the Son, The Lord says, my father will give it to you. Now, we go back to our last session. Do you believe that? <laughs> Brothers and sisters, when Christ says something, he means it. And he does not mean to deceive us. When it comes to the love of God in Christ being produced in our life, whatever we ask, in the Father's name, or in the name of the Son, the Father will do it. So there's prayer through him. And you will find that, that that prayer for love to be produced is throughout the, or the, the New Testament. Paul prays in Philippians 1 and 9, and this I pray that their love may abound yet more and more. It's almost like the, the much fruit, uh, or the more fruit than the much fruit. I pray that your love would abound more and more. First Peter 1 and 22, seeing ye have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. 1 Peter 2 and 17, honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. 1 Peter 3 and 8, finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful. Be courteous. You can see these dear men, Peter himself, Paul, what are they praying for? That love would be produced in the lives of his people. So let's go over them again. Dependency on him, attraction towards him, obedience to him, prayer through him. Verse 11, joy from him. These things have I spoken unto you that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. A joy that comes from remaining in his love. A joy that comes, brothers and sisters, from remaining in communion with Christ. If it is, that as a Christian, I'm engaged in sin and I'm not coming to the Lord to have my feet washed, I've either forgotten the joy of communion with Christ, or it's been a long, long time since I've experienced it. The joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of knowing that there is no distance between your heart and his. Filled joy, that's what John says in 1 John, these things write I unto you that your joy might be full that your joy might be full. Uh, even in the midst of difficulty, 
Acts 13.52, Paul and Barnabas were expelled from Antioch and Bithynia. And it says, and the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Romans 14 and 17, for the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace and joy by the Holy Spirit. First Peter 1 and 8, we uh, uh, quoted this verse before. First Peter 1 and 8, Darby's version says this, whom having not seen you love, on whom, though now not looking, but believing, ye exult with joy unspeakable and filled with the glory. This is what abiding in Christ means. It has to be an over, whenever, whenever a person is in that environment of the joy of God, the joy of Christ, rejoicing in his word, uh, dwelling in him, finding Christ to be the attraction of his heart or her heart, well then something miraculously happens. Love is produced and is evident for the glory of God and for others. And lastly, uh, before we before we leave, you've been very patient last night and today. Uh, just one more point. <clears throat> so we have those previous points, but the last thing I want to think about, abiding in Christ involves going out for him. So it involves dependency on him, attraction towards him, obedience to him, prayer through him, a joy from him, but then to go out for him. Look at verse 16. Ye have not chosen me. I don't think that's got to do with salvation. I think that's got to do with service. I have chosen you and ordained you in order that you should go and bring forth fruit. And so the Lord Jesus Christ here is commissioning his disciples that that love that they're enjoying becomes a witness to the world. You see, abiding in Christ, well, you put it this way, remaining in Christ is not complete until we go. So we need to go in order to remain. We need to go out with this fruit in order to remain in him. You remember when Mary sat at the feet of the Lord in, in Luke's gospel, Luke 10 and 1, uh, and Martha complained. The Lord says, Martha, Martha, they're careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Now that's communion. That's abiding in Christ. Okay? But the next time, one of the times we see then Mary in John chapter 12, Mary takes a pound of ointment of spikenard very costly and anoints the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the odour of the ointment. Now there's something. How can we fill this world, the stench of this world, with the odour of the love of God? Well, the Lord says in verse 17, these things I command you in order that you love one another. When we love each other with the very love of Christ, that becomes a witness. Brothers and sisters, it becomes a witness greater than apologetic lectures. Now, I think there's a need for those things, and they're good. But Christ says, if the world is going to see the reality of Christ and the reality of God, they will see it through the love that Christians have for each other, through fruit produced on the branches. From chapter 13 right through to the end of chapter 21, there's many, many verses about the Lord commissioning his disciples to go out. Look at chapter 15, verse, uh, well, we've done chapter verse 16. Look at verse 18. If the world hate you, just after this whole thing about producing fruit, he says, if the world hate you. Why does he say that? Because that's the realm in which this fruit is seen. And the love of God produced and seen in the lives of Christians will attract the hatred of the world. If the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. 
look at chapter 15, verse 27. And ye also shall bear witness, because you've been with me from the beginning. If you go to chapter 17 and verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And so a devotion to Christ <clears throat> that doesn't lead to a love for Christians, all Christians, and a love for all sinners is not a true devotion to Christ. Do we get that? Sometimes we can convince ourselves that we're devoted to Christ, but when we look at our lives and there's no sacrificial giving of ourselves for the Lord's people, and there's no sacrificial giving of ourselves for the lost, then that devotion that we think we have to Christ is not real. Real devotion to Christ always overflows in love to Christians and love for sinners. And so these six things, I think, seem to be in this section what it means to abide in Christ, to remain in communion with him, is to, de to be dependent upon him, is to have an attraction towards him, is to be obedient to him, is to pray through him, is to enjoy his joy. Brothers and sisters, just before we, we finish, it delights the Lord when we are delighted. <laughs> it rejoices his heart when we are joyful. Like, I, I don't know, sometimes we put a kind of view on God and on Christ that's not biblical. If, if you're a father, as I am, and you've got children, it rejoices your heart to see them happy. Of course it does. If you're a mother, to see your children content and uh, fulfilled, it rejoices your heart. How much more the love of Christ when he sees us rejoicing in him. There's uh, joy in him, and then there's that going out for him. Uh, and that's what seems to be involved in abiding in Christ. Now, I know we haven't looked at everything in this chapter, and there's a lot more in the chapter, and maybe some of you, dear brothers and sisters, have, have maybe different slants of views on it, but I, I think the general the general thought is very clear that the love, or the fruit is his love seen in our lives, and it's done by him being the vine, the father being the husbandman, and us being the branches and abiding in him, remaining in communion with the Lord. And so our private life with Christ, our personal relationship with Christ, becomes really the foundation of all our service for the Lord. Let's pray. <clears throat> our God and Father, we thank thee for thy good word. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus. We thank thee for thy Holy Spirit. We thank thee that we're all one family. We thank thee one day we'll all be together. What a day that will be. We thank thee we will rejoice in his love for eternity. We will rejoice in thy love for eternity. We thank thee we read those words together. Greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life. For his friends. And so together this evening, before we part, we thank thee and bless thee for the suffering and death of thy son for us. We thank thee for the power that raised him from the dead. We thank thee for his reception into heaven and for his care and his love over every one of us all the days of our life. We can say from our heart, surely goodness and mercy have followed us all the days of our life we will dwell in the house of the lord forever we bless thee in the saviour's name amen <clears throat>